In this class, we will be concentrating on three important Italian filmmakers. They are commonly associated with the neorealist movement. The first of the directors we'll be focusing on is Vittorio De Sica. De Sica started his career as an actor in uh, Italian masala films. They were known as white telephone films, films in which a white telephone would always be there. But even whilst he was acting, he was picking up the rudiments of filmmaking. He first came to the notice of film viewers in the early 1940s with The Children Are Watching Us. But it was with his uh, trilogy of solitude made in the period 1946 to 52 that he became a celebrity. The trilogy consisted of Shoeshine, The Bicycle Thieves, and Umberto D. Shoeshine is about two small boys who earn their living by shining shoes. They get into a lot of misadventures and are finally hauled away to a reformatory where their actual troubles begin. It is here that we see the innocence of the boys being destroyed by adult cruelties. <laughs> After this, Jessica made The Bicycle Thieves, which has had a seminal influence on generations of filmmakers, film technicians, film viewers. This film is unique in that it is at one and same time a classic and a favorite an all-time favorite with viewers all over the world. Uh, selling off a lot of things and pawning other things, other belongings, he is able to procure a bicycle only to have it stolen. The third of the trilogy, which Jessica made with his own money and hence was especially dear to him, was called Umberto D. It is a bleak story about an old pensioner who has to make do on a miserable government dole. Now these films together are referred to as the Trilogy of Solitude, but in between these three, Jessica made that fantastic film called Miracle in Milan, which the director described as a 20th century fairy tale. It's about the inhabitants of a shanty town who are ejected from their homes by a cartel of builders unable to stay on Mother Earth.
mythical creatures seek a home upward and the film ends on the refugees flying over the city of Milan on magic broomsticks. Jessica, at least for Ray, was uh, his films marked the highest point of Italian neorealism. In course of time, <coughs> Jessica <coughs> went to Hollywood and made many films. They were on a grander and more dramatic scale, but in no way enhanced the reputation that he had already made on Italian soil. The second master we will be discussing is Roberto Rossellini. Rossellini's film masterpiece, Rome Open City, made in 1945, has an interesting story. A wealthy old lady came to him with a proposal to make a documentary on a middle-aged priest who had joined the partisans in their fight against the German occupiers of Rome. This was World War II. Later on, the same lady came with a second proposal to Rossellini asking him to make a short film about a group of brave children who in their own way opposed the German occupiers. What Rossellini did was an act of unbelievable creative audacity. He fused the two stories. The story of the priest who became a martyr and the story of the defiant children and made a complete feature out of these two stories. <laughs> He is also very famous for his uh, tr for a trilogy, this time the war trilogy. The second part was called Paisan and the third Germania Anno Zero. Together they show how a besieged country fought back, especially workers and other common people. As students of cinema in this country, we ought to have a look at Rossellini's long documentary with fictional elements, elements thrown into it called India. In the 1950s, he came to India and traveled the length and breadth of the country and made this documentary which showed how he viewed the qualities of a society that was ancient, civilized, but also in certain ways how time was taking toll on it.
the third of the masters, Lucino Visconti. Visconti had a privileged upbringing, born in a noble family with fascist leanings. Early life, he had a passion for breeding horses. His other passions were music and the theater. His first film, Ossessione, made in the early 1940s, was one of the harbingers, along with Desica's The Children Are Watching Us, of the neorealist movement. Ossessione spoke of the common man, the working man, the troubles that they had to face, and how the human spirit ultimately triumphed. Once, on a visit to France, Visconti met uh, and worked briefly with the great master Jean Renoir. It was with, whilst working with Renoir that he formed his philosophy of both cinema and life. Returning to Italy, he joined the Communist Party, then one of the largest Communist parties in Europe, even got uh, involved in action against the Germans, and opened his palace to the resistance, where they could seek uh, physical refuge. After the war, the Communist Party commissioned him to make three films on uh, fishermen, miners, and peasants, but ultimately only one called La Terra Trema to do with the fishermen of the coast of Sicily materialized. In the evening of his filmmaking career, Visconti started making films which were more personal in character. The Leopard or Death in Venice was a departure. They were a departure from his earlier preoccupation with neorealist cinema. But they were also attractive and important. Before we conclude, we must focus our attention on two factors. One, what is neorealism? What is neorealist cinema? And second, is how did it affect Indian filmmakers in the 40s and 50s and even later. New realism was the first important movement in cinema 
following and even during World War II. The anarchic conditions then prevailing in Italy, the economic and also the spiritual blight that had set in compelled the masters of that movement to devise improvised ways of making films that were very close to the lives of the people. These were real films about the real lives of real people. So what they did, they relied on amateurs. People were literally picked off the street and made to act instead of relying on professionals and the studio system this was a huge shift towards a more realistic cinema the result of this was that the characters the stories the situations that are being depicted looked very close to the lives of the viewers. Another very important feature of this school of cinema was, this genre of cinema was that the directors took their camera out in the open. The films were shot on location, outdoor. No longer were the studios needed. And in fact, the studios were then, they had been reduced to rubble as a result of war bombing and other factors. This made Italian realist cinema a phenomenon that people all over the world have not forgotten to this day. Whatever certain critics might say about being outdated, Italian the Italians gave the lead, it was picked up all over the world, and it is neorealist cinema in different forms, with different faces, are being made all over the world even today. Even a few days before the Greek director, master Theo Angelopoulos died, he extolled the virtues of neorealist cinema and said, quite rightly, that as long as there is poverty, as long as there is exploitation, as long as there are two classes of haves and have-nots, neorealism in some form or the other, in some way, will always show its face on the screen. From Goda, to the Taviani brothers, Ponte Carvo, to all these masters, far from being an outdated movement, neorealism still appears as a most relevant body of cinema. If you see some of the best films, small films, coming from small places, in hitherto unheralded areas of the country, in India, films made in Punjabi, made in Marathi, you will see in small cities, Pune, a small town in Punjab, neorealism is still there. In our own country, I have already spoken 
of the influence that neorealism had on Ray. In the 50s, the films of Chetananand, Mahbub Khan, Bimal Roy, they all bore the influence. And in their, in their own way, they were doffing their cap to this very important body of work. All the three neorealist masters we have discussed in this class surprisingly belong to the upper classes. Yet their appreciation of the daily difficulties faced with courage and hope by the lower classes made them invent the neorealist genre as, as one critic has put it, as a logical consequence of the social awareness that emerged from the horrors of World War II to tackle social injustice in an exceptionally cinematographic way was the watchword of these masters and the many who have followed them since all over the world. Thank you.